uh, an academician throughout this institute for what almost uh, like 20 years. And Javier did his PhD at, uh, at uh, the Institute of Astronomy of Yunnan under my supervision when we were, both were young. Now we're both old. <laughs> but uh, uh, then, yeah, yeah, I, I keep telling him that the ratio of our ages keeps up. Uh, and um, and then while in the last year of his PhD, he did a pre-doc uh, stay at, at Harvard CFA, where he started a lifelong collaboration with Lee Hartman. And after that, he did a postdoc at uh, the American Museum of Natural History with Mordecai McClough. And um, and since then, he has been working here. Um, 2009, he got the state prize for. Uh, divulgación uh, for outreach, and in 2017 he he got a award from the Bessel Award from the Humboldt Society. So he he has large mission to be one of my of the everybody's favorite papers that I keep uh, hearing people asking me about it is his famous paper about six myths of the burial theorem. So uh, and now he's uh, and he's been working on this issue of gravity versus turbulence. He has a long list of papers, and this is what the seventh, the sixth, the, the sixth, okay, and about the Kennedy-Schmidt relation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So actually, that now that you mentioned that the, mm -hmm. that the I was at Harvard. Mm -hmm. The very first day I met uh, in his office to Lee Harman, he showed me the Kennedy book paper, the ninety-eight. It was ninety-eight. Mm -hmm. He showed me the paper. And I didn't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> and I stayed some time uh, not understanding this this correlation until recently that I decided to go into there. And then we 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 made this work uh, and submitted a couple of weeks ago, just before the monthly notices started to to, to charge pages. So <laughs> we were in a hurry. So this is the list of my collaborators, of course. Manuel is always there. Uh, he's uh, helping us a lot with the simulations. Carlos is, uh, is uh, helping us with the observations with the Herschel and, and Spitzer data. Aina was the original trigger of this of this uh, collaboration because uh, he had uh, he found some some interesting result and and he said, well you have an explanation I started to think about this and you know, so all this work tend to be after that. Then Bernardo and, and Eric are the extragalactic people that are uh, uh, taking care of my back or not making strong mistakes. Uh, Adriana is always helping me with the maths. And Diane and, and Carla are helping me with the analysis of the data. So anyway, uh, let me uh, give you the plan of the talk. First of all, uh, let me introduce the, the, the Smith conjecture. This is just uh, in a paper uh, 60 years ago or more, uh, Martin Smith uh, argued there was no proof, that it was just a con conjecture, uh, that the star formation rate has to be a power law of the gas density. It was just a guess. So the plan of the talk is, I will present you the mess that is the observational data. Everybody uh, publishes a particular correlation measured in a particular way. So then I will come up with some particular uh, uh, star formation law that we will call fundamental. And then everything will be up. <laughs> okay, so uh, at, in different points of this talk, I will make use of this fact. This is a result that we published back in 2012. Uh, and the point is that even though that the molecular clouds are highly structured and they have different densities, at any density threshold that you take, if it's column density or if it's volume density, if you take a, a column density threshold to define your clouds, most of the mass is at, do, at that low column density or at that uh, low volume density, such that the mean density and the mean column density are close to that version. Okay, that's important for, for this. Uh, in terms of the volumetric density, that's, this has been confirmed recently by, by the group of Charlie Lara and Alisa Rudman in a recent paper using uh, distances to the stars in local clouds such that they can infer the three-dimensional structure, the, the, the three-dimensional density, uh, uh, and they found indeed that every time you compute the, the that well, that most of the mass is that is at the low column at the low densities. So, um, now 
let's start with the definition. The star formation rate is uh, well. This is the this is the conjecture. So the star formation rate is the is the derivative of the mass that goes into 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 the stars. So how much mass goes into the stars per unit time? And uh, thirty years ago, Kenny could found these two correlations. So what he what he found is that the star that, that the column density, not the volumetric density, the column density of star formation correlates with the column density of gas to some power, and that power was 1.4. So the, every single point here is a whole galaxy. So the star formation rate in a particular galaxy has some value if you increase the column density of, of gas. And by gas here, I mean H1 and H2. Uh, then the, the, the star formation rate increases, but not linearly, but super linear, faster than linear. However, if you divide this column density of gas by the orbital time of these this galaxies, then the correlation becomes one. This was the, third, the, 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 the paper that somehow, somehow triggered everything. Then um, this correlation has been widely used even in numerical simulations to parameterize the stellar feedback in, uh, in the simulation. So for instance, the illustrious uh, for the simulations has this, this uh, star formation load. They, whenever you get some density threshold, they compute the column density and they put this star formation log to, 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 to mimic the, the feedback. So actually this is called the, 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 the law of star formation. So after that, Gao and Solomon computed somehow the star formation rate and they plotted against the dense mass. And they found a linear correlation between not, not the column density, but the star formation rate and the, and the, the mass in dense gas. And the correlation was uh, linear, not, not super linear. In this case, they have used uh, observations of HGN, which traces dense gas. Then uh, in the 2010, uh, in, the, in the first decade of, the, of this century, uh, Bigiel and, and, and that group start uh, analyzing uh, galaxies, but not of the whole galaxies as, as uh, not, not the whole galaxy as Kelly put, but trying to resolve the, the, the galaxies at, at, at least some particular scale. And what they found, uh, well, they, they analyzed the atomic gas, the molecular gas, and the total gas. And what they found is that when you analyze the atomic gas, the correlation is quite steep. If you analyze the, uh, the molecular gas, then the slope becomes flatter. And if you put both together, the correlation is not that steep, it's not that flat, it's intermediate. It's like, like 1.5 or something. Huh? So there is a power law and depends on which kind of gas you are analyzing. So, uh, also, more recently, in the same in the, the, the same team somehow, uh, a little bit larger team, uh, has been analyzing in particular molecular gas, and they found that there is a linear correlation between these, between these two quantities. Here in this plot, you have the contours of the density points of, of the points that you find for uh, uh, any two galaxies analyzed in molecular gas at a resolution every galaxy of one kiloparsec squared. So you here you have a lot of points at the same time. But when they divide by the orbital time, then the slope gets smaller than one. What was it before? Sorry? Sorry. Slow. What was it? One. This is linear. Yeah. But then you divide it by the by the orbital time and you get a flatter slope. Yeah. But take into account that when, when Kevin Kutu was analyzing the whole galaxy with the total gas, the slope was both slopes were were uh, larger. So as I told you, this is a mess. It's everybody got something different, and they found different slopes. Also, these guys uh, divided by the freefall time, computed in a particular way, we will see it, and they found that the slope is even flatter, it's two thirds. So, so uh, in terms of individual clouds, uh, we all analyzed HCM clouds in our galaxy. And they found that they follow the same correlation that the, the Gao and Sol in previous data, no? And, and, the, and, the, and the slope was also linear. At least it was consistent. However, Lada, in the, two, in the, in the second decade of, of this uh, century, he, he showed that, for instance, if you take clouds in our galaxy uh, at the same uh, density threshold, well, all these clouds have the same column density, but they have different star formation rates. 
So to confuse you a little bit more, LADA also found for local clouds that there is no correlation between a measurement of the star formation rate against the cloud mass. So no correlation in this case. But if you take only dense gas, then you have a linear correlation. So for the total gas, no correlation. For the linear, uh, for the dense gas, there is a linear correlation. Oh, so, so, yeah. So, um, so that cloud mass is gas mass in general. This is the, the total mass, and then you go not not gas total total uh, stars. Well, basically, is 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 gas. Gas, but yeah, not, the, the mass in stars is, is quite small. Okay. And that's just dense gas. This is only dense gas, yeah. like above ten to the three or. Mm -hmm. The, yes. This is above uh, 10 to the 3 and a half or something. And like this is that. just everything that's above. This is uh, from the 100 or above. Okay, so the original Schmidt law is with density, but you keep talking about mass the clouds. Well, you'll see, you'll see that there is a relation. So then uh, Lara uh, made an interesting analysis and he said, well, clouds are structured, so you can take large uh, high density isocontours and compute the column density of star formation rate and the column density of gas mass, and you find some points over here. You go to a lower density threshold, you find a different rate and even a lower, and you find a different uh, rate. And the slope in this case for a single cloud is around two. He did it for three different clouds, and consistently the slope was two. Uh, so the, the, the correlation in this case was this. Yeah. I'm not to say. When you talk about column density of star formation rate, you just talk about each other surface brightness. Mm, depend on it depends on the case. Okay. When you do uh, extragalactic studies, yes, that's the case. When you do HCNs, then you take uh, infrared luminosities. Well, also in, in extragalactic studies, you cannot use uh, infrared luminosities, H alpha, and also ultraviolet luminosities. In the case of galactic studies, you can count the number of stars, actually. And then you plot here the column density of number of stars, of stars, yeah? So uh, you'll see I mean, uh, in a while uh, uh, why this. So the, the correlation was a little bit different. This, in this case, the look is two. So, uh, and the same was found, found by Pokrel recently for a bunch of clouds, like 10 clouds in the solar neighborhood, uh, confirmed the same result. However, in particular, California, this is the only cloud that, that, uh, that, that is published with a different slope. It has a slope of three. Uh, and there is a reason for that, we'll see. Uh, but getting back to Cockrell, when they divided the column density of gas over the freefall time, then the correlation is it. And this is in contrast with whole galaxies, that, as I told you, that they showing that the correlation is flatter than linear. So, of course, <laughs> It's confusing, no? <laughs> uh, when I started to, 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 to understand this, I said, well, what the hell, what, what's, what's the reason for this? So I said, well, you know, I have to understand this. I, I tried to summarize uh, the different results uh, that, uh, that are probably, uh, or certainly there's, there should be more, but at least this is a, a, a general summary of the different correlations that I found. And the goal is, to see whether we can find a single explanation that accounts for everything. Uh, well, this. Yes. Sorry. In the uh, Sun paper that you showed, where they compare a bunch of different lines, what is the order of the uncertainty in the slope? And how does that compare to the spread? Mm -hmm. uh, we can discuss that in the study is, meeting. Yeah, in, <laughs> things, in none of these things, the, slope, the uncertainty is mentioned, then I don't know if one is different from 1.2 or not. Okay, well, I am a theoretician and I'm not sure about what <laughs> uncertainties. What I can tell you is that, uh, in general, I mean, if you are going to count uh, the, the number of protostars, that's a very certain number, the column densities, well, the measurements uh, in Herschel are quite certain. No, uh, sorry, my question is not about the uncertainties in data, but the uncertainty in the fit. Which you get by interpreting okay. your Okay, well, as, as a theoretician, I try to see these uh, these correlations as as a general trend, 
And of course, at high, as high column densities, this is falling down a little bit. So under the is not perfectly the same, but as a general trend, uh, you have a slope of one. So, okay. Okay, so. Um, so I start saying, well, you know, let's let's start from the very definition of star formation range, and let's try to compute as we are as astronomers, we cannot compute this time derivative, but we can compute this approach to the time derivative, which will be an average of some uh, particular uh, time scale. And that particular time scale will be the duration of the protostellar uh, phase. So that's what uh, typically observers do. And then from this equation, you can multiply by one, and the equation will be the same. So let's multiply it by one. We have this here, and then, if we define the efficiency per free fall time, I don't like that name, but yeah. that's the name that people yeah, get. It. If you define the free fall time as this quantity, you'll see why, then you get this relation. And this will be what I will call the fundamental equation of star formation. And I will call this fundamental because, first of all, it's derived from the very definition of star formation rate, basic algebra. And we will see that from this equation, we can understand all these different problems. So as, as, can you go back to the definition yeah. of the efficiency? So it is a ratio of two of two derivatives. One is the rate at which you're forming stars, and the other one is like the collapse rate of the gas. Uh -huh. okay. 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 So mm -hmm. let's first of all analyze the efficiency per people time, this, this uh, uh, quantity here. So in galactic studies, what people do is to estimate the mass that goes into stars. You count the number of stars. You know that there is a mean mass of, of every uh, single burst of star formation. So the mean mass is around 0 0.2, 0 0.3 solar masses. The IMF is highly piped. So this is a constant. The star formation phase lasts from particular time around, around a, if it's a metal phase, it, it, it lasts around a, 0.5 uh, million years. So this quantity and this quantity are constant. What about the other three factors? Well, if you remember that the GIS number is defined as the ratio of gas in mass, uh, the, the, gas, the mass gas that you have over the GIS mass, this is the GIS number. And if you remember, well, this, this is a, you know, just an example. You have a boat, you have a total mass, and you can compute, uh, based on the density, you can compute what is the, the gene's mass. So if this box is collapsing, you can expect that the number of stars will be proportional to the gene's mass. The larger the, the, the gene's masses you have here, the larger the number uh, of, of protostars that you will have. So this, uh, if you take this uh, gas mass here and, and put it here, you have this ratio, so you can transform this, this ratio in, into this one. But the free fall time and the G's mass both depends on the density. So that means that if you assume that the cloud is collapsing, then this factor is constant, this factor is constant, and the efficiency per free fall time is constant. So the constancy of the, of the famous uh, or infamous efficiency per free fall time is, <laughs> is constant, then that means that the cloud is collapsing. It's not turbulence, it's not uh, any other uh, effect. Okay, so let's now get back to try to reconstruct the different chemical unit laws. So we have here the, the, the fundamental equation of star formation and the most simple uh, equation to, to or, or correlation to, to prove is this plotted by, by Pockel. So Pockel, uh, this is just dividing by area both, both quantities here, and you see that different clouds have a, a almost linear uh, dependency on, on between the, the star formation rate of star formation and the gas over the free fall time. Okay, is so the fact it flattens at the high end significant. Sorry, is the fact is the flattening you see at the right hand side significant? Well, G, certainly, if, if you plot, for instance, the efficiency per free fall time as a function of column density, that goes down. So it may be because either feedback, it may be because probably at, uh, at smaller days, uh, uh, at larger densities, you start having this and having some support. I don't know what exactly is, is the reason. 
people doesn't uh, pay attention on this, but uh, we are just uh, taking right now attention on this. On so this to follow up yeah. time on that <laughs> question. There was yeah. another plot where you showed where it was the same effect of very low um, circuit densities. Well, well that, that, that might be certainly because not all the gas may be collapsing. Maybe uh, disturbed by, by, by shear, by whatever, no? Okay, so uh, we have all this mess, and then we can start eliminating, <laughs> start eliminating correlation. So, one less. So, getting back to this non correlation, you have a bunch of local clouds. Though all those clouds were observed with the same column density, and then of course they have a cycle to before. We are going to get back to this to this issue. Uh, and I show you. Uh, if you trace clouds with the same column density, then the mean column density is the same. So all these clouds have the mean column density, but everyone may have a different star formation rate. So that's why Lava didn't found a correlation here. Um, and of course, it, it, this will be the same as this if you take a single column density threshold here. So you have different clouds with different uh, star formation efficiencies. Uh, okay. So, uh, so what, what are the lines uh, in Popper's plots? In this uh, plot? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Every so, line is a single cloud. It's a different so the threshold is at different densities? Exactly. Threshold is okay. at different densities. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So we can eliminate this one. Mm -hmm. One less. In this case, uh, Lada was uh, showing that if you go low to low densities, then there is no correlation. And that may be because not all gas is actually forming stars. If not all gas is actually forming stars, then the efficiency per full time doesn't have to be constant. So another one. So then about this linear correlation between the star formation rate and the dense gas, well, you know, you have these two here. Of course, you have the free full time here. But if you remember the fact that clouds with the same density threshold have the same mean density, they will have the same, also the same three four time, then you can understand the Gauss and Solomon correlation because he's showing this the, the, the correlation between the circulation rate and the, the mass and dense gas. And all these all, all these points are observations with HEN. And HEN is a tracer of dense gas. The dense gas is around 10 to the 4, sometimes 10 to the 4. So all these have the same three time, and of course they fall. They, they follow the same correlation. Those are stragalactic, these are galactic, or at least these ones. I think I believe that these are also these are the same. Um, but then this is basically the same correlation. So, and why is the same correlation? Well, because they are serving the same gas with the same density. In the case of Lada, uh, in this case, this is a mass uh, inferred from, from, from extinction. So they don't have the same density as this and this. But Charlie took care of uh, trying to be careful of having exactly the same or, or more or less the same volume density. So indeed, uh, as he argued in his paper, these clouds should have the same volume density and then the same three fold time, and then the correlation is straightforward. So let's eliminate another three. One, two, <laughs> and three. Okay. This is probably the most confusing and difficult to, to, to prove. So uh, in this case, you have local clouds at different thresholds. These, uh, these are different local clouds. This is a local cl cloud also, but it's, it's a particular case. It's California, OK? It has a different, uh, a different slope. So let's start with the, with the first one. So you have the free fall time here. The free fall time goes as the density to the minus one half. And then you can put the mass over the cube of the of the size to the minus one half. You introduce this in the in this, and you get this. Of course, from here to here, I also divide by the area uh, in both in both sides of the equation. And you want this uh, correlation to be proportional to some power of the gas density. Okay, so you have this. But 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 you also know that molecular clouds follow a correlation between the mass and the size. So if you use this information, then you can correlate the exponent of the mass size correlation with the exponent of the uh, of the chemical mean law. Okay, that's a first step. 
The second step is remembering that you can compute also the mass and the size from the PDF of the clouds. How, for the students, how do you construct a PDF of the cloud? Well, you have the, 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 the map of the cloud, you have different column densities, and at every different density, you can count the number of points of the number of pixels that you have at that column density, and that gives you a height in this plot. You go to another column density threshold and you count a, a different number and so on, and you construct your, your probability distribution function. So you have a probability distribution function, and typically for molecular clouds in the solar neighborhood, we found that it's a power law with some power law exponents. So, so Using this, you can prove that the area of the cloud is the, the zero moment of the, of the PDF, and the mass is the second moment of the PDF. So you have mass, and here you have the square of the size. So you can, again, compute the mass size relation, and you find a relation between the exponent of the mass size relation and the exponent of the PDF. So you have the alpha 1 and alpha 2, you can make them equal and, and then infer what will be the exponent of the chemical to Smith relation based on the uh, PDF uh, shape. Okay, so let's analyze first this, this, uh, this map, uh, this, this, uh, this plot, sorry. And uh, there are no PDF for every single cloud here, but at least there are PDFs for three clouds. Perseus, and the PDF has a dot of three. If you put three here, you get two here, and indeed you have a, a, a correlation with exponent two. If you go to Orion A, you get the same. Orion A is here, and Orion B is also over here. So they, they, these three clouds have a PDF that has a, that is decreasing with a power law of a, equals a, with, with a power law index of three. And they give you this beautiful correlation. So let's eliminate the other one. What about California? Well, California has a different exponent. How can we explain it? Well, you know, using Gaia data to California, uh, Johnny Cardinale and Sarah Retail have found that the cloud is not as compact, is not as dense as, as, as uh, other local clouds. And what they say, in, actually, in the abstract, is that uh, uh, California or Orion A is considerably higher density of structure than, than California. So California is a diffuse cloud. It's a large cloud that has much less dense gas. And this is reflected in the PDF. The PDF has a, 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 a decreasing exponent of four. That means that you have much more diffuse gas than this gas. So maybe not all gas is for this task. Maybe not all gas is collapsing. And then the efficiency per default time is not constant. And then you, you have a different approach. So that will be my explanation for California. And let's eliminate it. <laughs> now, let's go to the extragalactic stories. Uh, for molecular gas, BGL in the 2008, but, but more recently, a uh, sun for these 82 galaxies in the solar, in the, in the, in the vicinity of, of uh, well, in the local universe. They found this linear correlation between the star formation rate and the, star form and the, and the gas mass in, in, in molecular mass. So um, let, me, let, me, let me explain how they, they, they observe here. So you have here a map of molecular gas. Even though you, 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 you may think that all the area is filled, actually molecular clouds are very small compared to one kiloparsec uh, square areas. Molecular clouds have, are, are very filamentary. They have sizes of uh, 10 parsecs, 20 parsecs maybe, but they are small compared to the area that you are sampling. So even if you have a one cloud and then you call density in this area, this is small, or many clouds, and the and column density is large, basically, all these clouds have the same volume density, even if the column density is different. So all these clouds are, have always the same density. They, those are CO observations in both cases. So they have 
the same trifold time because they are at 100 particles per, per cube centimeter. So if they have the same trifold time, then the correlation follows as far as the gas that we are observing is collapsing. So, well, this is just start to remember you that the trifold time is the same because the volume density is the same. So, so another one that we can eliminate. Now, this other correlation between the H1 and H2, and this is, this is, this is funny to, to, to understand it. So you have the galaxy here, and you start analyzing regions far from the, from the center. Those regions has, have less, the, a small column density, and then you can see that the column density is the, the, the mass, the total mass uh, in gas over the area. You go deeper into, into the galaxy, you have a larger column density, so the column density is larger, the mass is larger, but the area is the same. But even if you increase this by two or by a some factor, that doesn't mean that this mass in H1 and in H2 increases in the same rate. The larger the column density, you have a more opaque, opaque gas, a more dense gas, and then you will start trading H1 into H2. You have a larger amount of, of, of H2. So uh, if you, you go then deeper into the galaxy, even more, and then you repeat the same process. And again, the H1 mass is smaller and the H2 mass is larger. So even if this increase were linear, the mass in H2 is superlinear. So that's why you go superlinear here, because you have proportionally more mass in H2 than in H1. But the, correlate, the, base, the basic correlation still is linear in, the, in, in, in H2, in, in molecular gas, in the gas that is collapsing. OK, so another one that goes away. Now, we have this linear correlation between the star formation rate and the molecular gas. OK, what happened when we divide by the threefold time of galaxies, computed for galaxies? Well, the funny thing is that this is clearly in contrast to this other result. Here we have a sublinear correlation. Here we have a linear correlation for individual molecular clouds. So why this difference? Well, the reason is the following. For this work, the authors are computing the density as the column density over the size. So the three-fold times depend on the, on the volume density. And of course, if you have larger densities, you get smaller three-fold times. So let's imagine that we have our, our solution element into the galaxy. We have one cloud here. We have some molecular mass, and we have some column density of gas. We have two clouds. Each cloud is at the same density, but I'm computing a different density because I am computing a different column density. So yeah, my column density is different, and my my inferred triple time will be different, even though these two clouds may be collapsing at the same triple time. You can have 10 clouds, and then you have 10 <laughs> times more column density and 10 times more density, and then your threefold time will be one third of the previous threefold time. What that means is that if you have a linear correlation here with, before dividing by, by the threefold time, if the correlation was linear, then you are stretching this quantity by a factor of three. So that's why the slow falls, falls a little bit uh, by a factor of two thirds. To, uh, sorry, to a slope of two thirds. So but the basic equation, again, is this one. Just that, in this case, we are computing a false <laughs> three for time. Now, OK, this is stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's eliminate it. We are almost done. Now, again, let's start from the from the linear correlation between rate of, uh, between the column density of star formation rate and the column density of molecular gas. And when we divide it by the orbital time, it's also flatter. Well, the correlation, uh, this correlation can be understood if you remember that these galaxies, my students that, that have a, 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 a galactic astronomy with me, know that the column density of the, of the gas 
is a, a decreasing exponential of the size. So you, you know that the column density of the, of the gas has this log here, this, this, this shape. Uh, this is a log link correlation uh, plot, so the, the, the correlation is an exponential. So you know that the galaxies are orbiting, and as a first, first approach, we can assume that the galaxy is rotating uh, in a flat uh, rotation curve. So we can uh, solve here uh, for R, substitute here, and find an expression for the orbital time. So the denser uh, cloud here will have a smaller orbital time. So if I had originally a linear correlation and I divide it by a large number, I stretch this into here uh, more than the low column density uh, guys. So we did this, uh, we did this for, for, for a model of galaxy, and this is the linear correlation. Well, this is not the, the, the original correlation. This is just a, a plot with slope of one. And we have here different, depending on the orbital parameters that you that you consider here, the velocity or the or the the, the these, these parameters here, the sigma zero, the, the r zero, or the v circular, you have different models. But the basic point is that. In this regime that these guys are observing, the slope here is around 0.8. So again, the orbital, uh, this uh, this uh, plot can be understood in the same way. So we end up with the Kennicott original plot. <laughs> so, but this is, after all, what I have said, it's quite easy to understand that these galaxies have proportionally much more hydrogen, uh, neutral hydrogen than molecular, and these guys will have much more uh, molecular hydrogen than nitrogen, than, than, than atomic, sorry, because the, these are denser and these are less dense. So that's why the super linearity is here. So we have already discussed this. And of course, if it, but, but the star formation rate, uh, the, the star formation law still is, is this one. And finally, of course, if you divide by the by the um, by the orbital time, then you get a flatter correlation here. So at the end, we understood everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So as a summary, we have the Kelly Cook's Newton's law uh, relation original. This is super linear as a consequence of factor increase of molecular uh, uh, hydrogen when you increase the column density. You have the linear correlation for H1, for, sorry, for HCN, because they have the same free fold time, and they are around there. <clears throat> In the case of galaxies, this is this is for uh, for HCN uh, that is more or less uh, well resolved. In the case of of uh, of uh, of this data here, it's those are galaxies, those are small parts of galaxies. But again, they are using zero clouds, which has also the same triple time. And then the correlation, again, is linear. And when you analyze individual clouds in the solar neighborhood, the slope is larger because, uh, because of the internal structure of the clouds. So this is this was graphically. In terms of words, you have a fundamental equation of star formation. The constancy of the triple time, the efficiency per triple time means collapse. And galactic and extragalactic correlation can be understood from this equation. Then uh, some implications. First of all, turbulent support uh, cl supported clouds have no constant efficiency per full time. They don't have power loss. They are the, 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 the PDFs are not normal. And indeed, Paduan and Kim have shown that efficiency per full time depends on the real parameter when you have a cloud. So the, the chemical unit law is not explained by turbulence, it's explained by collapse. Then you have a, this equation here implies something quite interesting. The constancy, the constancy of this, the physical per full time implies that the, implies that the ratio of star formation rate over the collapse rate is constant through the evolution of the collapse. Mm -hmm. And then this has implications for cloud-based structure, and we are working on that. And finally, uh, we believe that the, uh, understanding the value of the slopes for, for whole galaxies also may have implications for the structure of galaxies. So, thank you very much.
Are the questions in the auditorium? I will get them. So what's the value of epsilon free mm -hmm. It's around 0 0.01. Yes. Is it not too large because you will, uh, the, the free fall, uh, I think of the four years or something. So again, that would mean that you uh, transform more gas into stars like in a few million years. Well, okay, that's that's exactly the point of the of um, the 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 relevance of star formation feed and the feedback is that you cut that you cut out the star formation event. So uh, you start having massive stars and they blow up the whole cloud. And then the star formation, the, the net, the final efficiency of star formation is small. But that doesn't mean that, uh, that this is not valid. So in other words, the star formation law, the chemical Smith law, can be understood completely just from collapse. Now, the low efficiency of star formation is because of, of feedback. But that doesn't explain the, 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 the Smith law, the chemical Smith law. Another question? Yeah, yeah, cool. So, <laughs> I think I'm hard to believe. It's no, no, no. Really for me too, no? <laughs> Actually, you, you, you made it seem too easy. <laughs> to, uh, so, um, if, if I would construct uh, one of these Ken Kashmir law, the best way to do it would be either with the HCN or CO. That with something that is collapsing here, there's enough. Oh, yeah. Okay. So so basically, if you if you measure HCN, you you can assume uh, that you're measuring collapsing gas. Mm -hmm. Okay. All but this. Gas <laughs> All well, gas? almost. Almost. Let's have a that <laughs> Right. Right. No, no, that's. And then you're confusing me even more. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, according, according, if you follow this, Lada is showing that it's not all gas is collapsing. Ah. H1 is not collapsing. <laughs> that's why you don't have that correlation. So, mm -hmm. so the, 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 this law follows only if the gas is collapsing. You add H1, then you have a different slope. You have, the, the, the efficiency of perfect time is not. Yeah, I, I missed that. Okay, yeah. so okay, so basically you're saying the Ken Kashmir law, uh, Ken Kashmir law is a law which should be for collapsing gas, and whenever you don't observe, or you observe a uh, deviation uh, from that is because the gas is not collapsing. Exactly. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay, because there is some gas that is yeah. And uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, so in fact, usually people use the the. Um, surface density, uh, but there are some papers that claim that the real or, or, or that, for example, a uh, much um, tighter correlation, can uh, or can law, is observed if you use uh, volume. Yeah, but well, that's more difficult. Uh, yes, that's that's more difficult. In fact, they do some magic trick. Yeah, yeah. yeah, actually, that's why I didn't wrote this equation in terms of of, of density. So this was what the basic algebra. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is just basic algebra. If you divide by volume or by by there, then you have the other one. Yeah. Okay, so my first impression, I have to give it in Spanish, no? O sea, que es un número, multiplícalo por cuatro, divide entre dos y resta el número que pensaste y te sale lo que tú quieres, ¿no? ¿Eso es lo que entendiste? No, no. Eso es lo que entendiste. Antes de que saliera John Travolta, ¿no? Uh -huh. No, but really the take home message is don't bother with H1. And if you can measure masses, volume densities, and filling factors. Mm -hmm. And it would be very interesting to try to do that. I mean, it, yeah. it would be very hard, but very interesting to actually try to do this directly and, and prove if it is True, if your conjectures, mm -hmm. which make things look too easy, are true. That's what that's what my take home message would be, no? Mm -hmm. okay. Try to prove observationally all the algebra tricks that I showed. And invite Sundar to, to take care of the errors. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. And I'm also surprised that you 
had time to do beyond, beyond the science the cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and we can. So, well, first, uh, just clarification. Uh, I, I was partially joking there, but uh, what I meant, what I really meant is that it's not just constrained to the high density gas. So, even lower density gas can be collapsing. It depends a lot on, on our local conditions. Yeah. You know? uh, so, it's just not not just the HCM, but that, that's okay. what I really well, yeah, tried to say. about molecular gas that makes it collapse to the atomic gas. Oh, it's called there, and he's against. But also, but that even the low density. I mean, low in molecular. Uh -huh. But uh, so, so there's a lot of things here. Uh, Elmer Green himself is, is, is even more extreme than we are. He claims that everything is collapsing in his 2018 paper. Uh, and he argues that it's just a difference in, in, the, in the mode of collapse depending on the geometry. So I, I'm not going to say yes or no to that. I'm just going to say that he does argue that. Uh, now, uh, what's special about the molecular gas, uh, if we believe Mordecai, and Mordecai and Simon Glover so, sort of convinced me about that, is that the molecular gas is sort of a tracer of the collapse, in, in the sense that you do form molecules because the gas is collapsing. That's what he told us here a month ago or something like that. I tend to agree with that. Yeah, well, that that's also something that uh, we say in the Right, exactly. As soon as it becomes molecular, it becomes gravitationally stable and collapses. Right, exactly. No? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so now, the, my, my last comment is actually that you can, in our 2018 paper with Manuel also, we suggested that that scatter plot that, uh, from Charlie Dada's paper is actually like an evolu a, a, a plot of clouds at different evolutionary stages, because it is true that when a cloud is collapsing, its dense mass fraction is increasing over time. Mm -hmm. and, and so you could say that all clouds, all, all of, the, of, of the clouds in Charlie Lada sample are collapsing, but there are different stages. And, and because star formation rate accelerates, uh, then you measure different efficiencies. But so in, in that paper- Different efficiencies? Uh, yeah, it, absolute efficiencies, not, not the frequent time. Absolute efficiencies, mm -hmm. that's just blocks, mm -hmm. no? Uh, but, but that can be also understood as the fact that less evolved clouds, even though they are still collapsing, they have a larger fraction of low density gas, which you don't. No. So, uh, and, and then I have more comments, but that's okay. 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 So something that I remember to, uh, to say now that I didn't say before is that uh, individual clouds have a larger star formation rate. But that's just because you are, uh, in these cases, you are smoothing over a big area. So, so or, yeah, uh, the local clouds have these uh, larger values of the y axis. No? Mm -hmm. uh, so, they, they, if you put this, uh, a bunch of clouds like this in, into large areas, then these guys go down here and down here. Mm -hmm. So, and they, uh, they fit this. But here. this logo also changes. Well, you need to put yes, because, well, that that will depend. The, the point is that you cannot do this analysis for galaxies. You cannot analyze the cloud at different density thresholds and complete different star formation at the rate at that threshold. That's impossible in extragalactic observation. So, so in this case, you are tied to to having a single tracer with a single three fold band. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to quickly jump to Zoom and come back. We have one question, Pepe Franco. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, thanks, Javier, for this uh, review of all these confusing uh, results. And um, there are some others that might get this thing a little bit more confusing. But I think uh, some of them might be clarifying a few things. Uh, if one looks only at the gas without uh, taking into account the conditions in which the gas are embedded, then one might be missing something there. And there is a, a paper that was uh, published in 2020 by Jorge Barrera Ballesteros and Sebastian Sanchez and some others in which they found a linear relationship between the star formation rate per unit area with the pressure of the gas 
at the at the place. Uh, and this was done for 96 galaxies. The, the relationship is, is very nice, and it might show that there are some differences in the inner parts of the galaxies to the outer parts of the galaxies. And actually, we're, uh, we're checking that part. But um, it will be very important for you to take a look at that paper and see how does it fit with the scheme that you're constructing. Yeah, well, yeah, actually, that's exactly uh, that paper that you're talking about is, the, is this paper that I have here, the, the, the plot on the left. Uh, and this is the same data. And indeed, they have this correlation with the pressure. Uh, and I have to confess that uh, on the hurry of sending the paper to the mountain Nazis before the eight charges came, <laughs> to, came to, to kill me, uh, I, I decided to, to, to left that part. So we didn't analyze that part. That's something that we have to understand under the light of this uh, star formation law. But yeah, thank you for, for, for remembering yeah, that. Well, sure, we can talk about this uh, uh, later. Uh, but I think uh, there is plenty of physics to be extracted with this from this data. Yeah, sure. sure. Okay. Thanks, Pepe. We had a question from Greece. The question is, uh, all the papers that you mentioned, they say anything today uh, with this formation, like they are getting different snow, so they are in the result. Not necessarily. Yeah, I mean, I was like troubled. I was really confused with all this mess. And, you know, some people try to get to, to, to type, to, to correlate their correlation to the original chemical speed law or to the conjecture or whatever, no? So, so not necessarily they explain exactly. Typically, the, the typical phrase that you can find in the paper is that must be turbulence and that must, and the star formation has to do something, but, but nobody really understands. No? Um, the the Paduan uh, and collaborators and also the group of Libo Striker, uh, Kim, the Korean guy and Striker, uh, have tried to, to understand in terms of turbulence, and they found that the efficiency per full time depends on the on the on the turbulence. No, but the funny thing is that observations found that the efficiency per full time within a cloud is constant. So uh, that's something that that Pocret showed. Uh, so in that sense, then it cannot be turbulence <laughs> what drives the, the transformation. So can you say that the people like right now is 50-50 between children and somebody or what is it? No, no, no. But basically everybody, actually last week, Sebastian Sanchez in the in the in the meeting of uh, physics, uh, the physics meeting, uh, he he mentioned that that star feedback and turbulence may have a, a, an important role in defining this affirmation, the chemical law. Yeah, no, so that's a typical uh, yeah. That's the standard. And I guess the, the fear is that if, if you believe that it's, a, it's gravity, then the final efficiency should, should be large, mm -hmm. should, should be 100%. But that's not the case because the formation cuts everything. It's not that it really drives the law, but it just cuts it when the efficiency is around 3%. You could say that gravity drives the slope and, uh, and feedback drives the the intercept, you know, with another version, something like that. Mm, that's something to think about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Was that your, yeah. I, I, I actually, because you told me you were going to a conference and Krampus is going to be there. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'll pretend I'm Krampus for a second. Okay. And I'll tell you, but that's the question I've been, we've been saying is true all the time. Yes, I didn't say that I did yeah, but in first place this equation. This equation but it has been around uh, for some time, mm -hmm. but but people have just presented it. Mm -hmm. So I at least try to say, well, how can I infer this equation? No? Uh, so of course, in the original equation by 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 Smith, you have as uh, as a density or, or a star formation rate, and on the other hand, you have density, so the units don't, don't match. Mm -hmm. So my feeling is that people have tried to find what is the way in which the units 
have to match, and of course you came up with this this sort of equation. Yeah. yeah. And another comment is that sometimes you use t orbital and sometimes you use t triple, and I think the Frankel's uh, uh, has emphasized that it has to be the triple time, not the orbital. Well, yeah, well, I, I, I did the orbital time because these guys also did the orbital time, and I wanted to, to explain this one. But the, but the point is that the relevant time is the free fall time because actually in the derivation of this equation, you can divide by any time. We need a triple time, the crossing time. The point is whether the efficient, this factor of this epsilon will be constant or not. If it's the turbulent time, the turbulent crossing time, then maybe this this this, uh, this equation has no constant epsilon, and then maybe there is no problem, not a correlation. That 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 would be my bet. Uh, so so yeah, it has to be the free fall time, but still people, since people is finding correlation with the orbital time, they implicitly assume that maybe the Circular motions matter for this, for the formation efficiency or the or for the for the formation of stars. And actually, what we are saying is that it does. Once the gas becomes gravitational uh, unstable, it collapses and it forms stars in in the G's way. One last uh, question. Well, I was very afraid to ask because I was late, so I was afraid that you had already said it, and I wanted to ask what the rationale was for using orbital terms. But I think you said it, but sure. then. Star formation only happens in spirals. It's it's a very funny thing, no? Ah, well, it happens in spirals and in irregulars. I know, but irregular. I don't know if yeah. what the rotation is in. Uh, ah, well, yeah, of course, we'll do something. You cannot compute this equation. So that was very strange. It was a very strange thing to use. And I think it's because people take it as a proxy for the characteristic for time, but it's just a proxy. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, precisely, Prunkels has emphasized that the right time to take is the free fall. Uh, but and you can say that, that because the orbital time is dominated by gravity, also okay. that it's a good proxy. Uh, right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have one question on Zoom again, Pepe. Yeah. Uh, regarding the efficiency, uh, I will say that uh, the efficiency is defined by the energy injection, either radiative or mechanical into the molecular cloud, because the destruction of the cloud is the, the, the key parameter that defines how efficient is the star formation process. So I don't, I don't understand how the free fall time or the orbital time has to do with this when you know, it, it 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 seems natural that the efficiency is provided by the feedback from the actual stars that are being born in a given cloud. Yeah, the, the final efficiency, that's right. But the 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 chemical to Smith law is driven by gravity, not by the feedback. The rate of collapse. Yeah, by the by the rate of collapse. So the, the question on the top of, of this of this transparency, that's just because of gravity. The feedback has nothing to do there. The final efficiency, of course, it, 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 it's, it's quite small because you have feedback. Yeah. Okay. Thanks again, Pepe. Uh, let us thank Javier again. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was useful practice. <laughs> <laughs>